people who are irrepressibly optimistic. I'm sure all of us know people who, no matter what life throws at them, they seem to be able to cope. These are the people who look on the bright side. I'm sure we also have friends and know people whose minds seem to be invaded by a negativity and a pessimism. At the more serious end, this can develop into anxiety and depression. These are people who just cannot seem to see the positive in life. So why is this? Why do we differ so much from each other in how pessimistic or how optimistic we are? Well, in my research over many years now, I've been trying to really find what is the core of these differences? Where do these differences come from? And the answer we found is actually rather surprising. And in a shameful plug for my forthcoming book, I've written, <laughs> I've written about, I actually only got these covers yesterday, so you're the first people to see the covers. The book isn't actually out yet. But in the book, I really present this research that we've been doing over many, many years, really trying to find out what are the roots of optimism and pessimism. A lot of people argue there may be an optimism gene. In fact, some of my own work has been called the discovery of the optimism gene. Genes are obviously important, but they're not the full story. And there certainly isn't a single gene that determines whether we're optimistic or not. Obviously, us humans are far more complex than that. There isn't a single gene that is going to determine our outlook on life, nor is there a single life event that is going to determine our outlook on life. But what is important is the fact that our brains are highly selective. We don't notice everything in the world. We notice some things much more than others. Now, if we go back several hundred years, William Shakespeare said that there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Now, could this possibly be true? Could how we think about things really make a difference to our outlook on life? Well, contemporary psychological science and neuroscience suggests that actually Shakespeare had it right. Although what most psychologists nowadays mean when they talk about thinking probably isn't what Shakespeare meant when he used the word thinking and probably isn't what most of us might um, think when we, we talk about thinking. As I said, our brains are highly selective. We tune into some things more than others. Now, Going back to the founder of experimental psychology in the United States, William James, he made the famous comment that the world, the infant is born into a blooming, buzzing confusion. And if you think about it, even today, walking around London, I'm sure if you just think of the amount of sounds and smells and sights that you were bombarded with, can you imagine the problem of the brain of an infant who is born into the world? How on earth can the brain figure out what's important and what isn't important? What's the signal and what's the noise? Well, it shouldn't surprise us that nature has given us a helping hand. We don't come into the world as a blank slate. We actually have a little bit of a steer. And the most important things that our brain tunes into are, in fact, things that are good for us, things that are going to benefit us in some way, and things that are bad for us in some way. So in other words, the two great motivators are actually fear on the one hand and um, pleasure on the other hand. These are the two things that it's really important to notice. Now, in the kind of research that I do and many other psychologists do, we use usually visual stimuli. So we simply ask people to look at these kind of images, whether they're pictures or they're words, and we either measure what's going on in people's brains or we see where people's eyes are looking, so we see where people are looking. As I said, most of the kind of things that people tune into are very negative things or things that are good for us, things that um, involve pleasure. Now, it might surprise you, in some of the experiments at the University of Essex that I've conducted, um, female students at Essex actually pick the upper right-hand corner as the most interesting photograph in this. So I'm not sure what that tells you about University of Essex students. But the interesting thing is we have these two great motivators that pull our brain, the fear system and the pleasure system. Now, just to show you, this is just a brain scan. This is actually an, an average brain scan of 50 people's brains. And it shows an area called the amygdala. I'm not sure how well you can see it there. It's basically at the level of your ears inside the center of your head. 
The amygdala is basically the brain's fear system. Anytime we're in danger, its sole job is to pick up danger very quickly, any threat or anything negative, and help us to deal with that. Equally poetically named is the area in the brain, which is a pleasure system, called the nucleus accumbens. Now, the interesting thing is that both the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens, every living creature on this planet has, has these structures in their heads, deep in their brain, and actually they don't differ very much. If you look at reptiles, they'll have a very similar amygdala to humans. But what does differ with humans, of course, is that we have um, a, a huge cortex, so the upper areas of our brain have, tr have grown tremendously. And what this means is that these ancient systems in our brain, our fear system and our pleasure system, develop circuits with higher areas in our brain. And these are what I call the rainy brain and the sunny brain. So the rainy brain, not surprisingly, is the part of the brain that leads into more pessimistic and more negative mindsets. The sunny brain leads into more optimistic mindsets. So let's have a look at the rainy brain. Now, this is a very simplified version. And in honor to Gavin there, we've even put some little rainy clouds in there. Um, this is a very simplified version. Obviously, the things are a lot more complicated than this. But basically, the rainy brain is made up of this ancient amygdala, which is deep in our brain, and the prefrontal cortex, which is like an inhibitory part of the brain. Obviously, it wouldn't do as much good if we had an alarm system in our brain that was constantly reacting. So every time we saw something threatening, we either had to fight or flee. So of course, the upper areas of our brain operate more like a brake. So it's like an accelerator and a brake system. So what happens is that over time, circuits develop that really lead into this rainy brain or sunny brain system. So likewise, if we look at the sunny brain, it's a very similar kind of structure. So once again, right at the heart of it is the nucleus accumbens, or the pleasure system. And again, circuits develop with the prefrontal cortex. Now, what happens with these kind of circuits is that as we, from the moment we're born, our brain is naturally tuned in to positive things and to negative things, or things that might harm us and things that uh, might, might be good for us, or things that uh, will bring us pleasure. And a little bit like water carving out a riverbed, what happens is that these circuits get more and more ingrained into our brain. So cells communicate with each other and circuits develop. And the more these circuits develop, the more embedded and entrenched they get in our brain. So the more and more difficult they are to change. Now, of course, the core thing is that each of us has a rainy brain and a sunny brain that is unique, a little bit like fingerprints. These are absolutely unique to each of us. But very unlike fingerprints, the interesting thing is that these brain circuits are highly flexible and open to change. Just to show you how these circuits differ, again, in the kind of experiments we do, we simply show people different images, things like threatening faces, friendly faces, neutral faces, and we measure what's happening in people's brains. Now, I'll just show you um, one slide from a study that I did recently with some colleagues at the University of Cambridge. Now, this shows you, this is the amygdala here. So remember, that's the ancient fear system. On the graph on the right, along the horizontal axis, as you go to the right, this is higher scores on a questionnaire measure of anxiety. So we simply ask people to say how anxious they were. Now, these weren't clinically anxious people. These were just a student population, so we're not dealing with extreme levels of anxiety. But as you can see, even within this small range, the higher levels of anxiety were correlated with increased reactions to the amygdala when people saw angry faces. So compared to seeing just a happy face or a neutral face, just a photograph of an angry face kick-started the amygdala. So the important point is that there are huge individual differences in how our rainy brain and our sunny brain reacts. And this, I think, has really important implications, ultimately, for our mindset. Do we develop into real optimists or do we develop into pessimists? Now, as I said, the way these brain circuits develop is very much like a river. They get more and more ingrained in our heads and more and more difficult to change. 
But what my research and the research of many other people now shows that actually it's not impossible to change these um, brain states. And in fact, this is a very optimistic message in many ways. There are many, many things that we now know on good scientific grounds do actually lead to changes. So we can overcome very pessimistic mindsets and to turn into more optimistic mindsets. Again, it probably won't surprise you to find out that it's not as simple as just having happy thoughts. Many self-help books might tell you, all you need to do is, is to think, everything's going to be fine, and sure enough, everything will be fine. It's a little bit more complex than that. I think human beings are a lot more complicated than that. But nevertheless, based on good scientific evidence, we know, for example, that cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very typical psychological intervention for people with depression or anxiety, that does lead to real changes in these brain circuits. I've been working with a, a task called cognitive bias modification, which is a very simple computerized type of task, which is literally trying to retrain people's brains to focus in a more positive direction. Things like mindfulness meditation has been shown to really change these brain circuits. Some of my colleagues at the University of Essex have also discovered that simply being in nature um, can lead to real changes in how our brain operates, and I'm sure observing clouds is an important part of that. So the message really I want to just conclude with is that in many ways, going back to Shakespeare all those years ago, in many ways he did get it right. Nothing is really good or bad, but thinking does make it so. But I hope I've shown you that thinking is a much deeper thing than probably Shakespeare himself would have thought. Thanks very much.